delighted to introduce our University of Arkansas Press Spotlight author, Brooks Blevins. Brooks Blevins has spent his life studying and writing about the people of his native regions, the South and the Ozarks. He's been at the forefront of a new and exciting Ozark Studies movement that is working to see the stories of Ozarkers through a more realistic, less exotic lens. Tonight, he will read from and discuss his most recent book, Up South in the Ozarks, Dispatches from the Margins. Copies of the book are available for purchase. Thank you, Pearl's Books, for being here and for signing after the presentation in the back of the room. Brooks, thanks so much for being here. I'm going to turn things over to you. All right, thanks, Renee. Well, it's good to be back in Fayetteville. I, I think I was here about a year or so ago. It seems, it seems like it seems like that was about right. And uh, you know, I, I've been on sabbatical for for the past year, so it's been the fastest year of my life. <laughs> this really went by. It's like yesterday. I was I was here, uh, but it's been it's been nice. Uh, I'm glad. To, uh, to have this book out. If, uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to look at it, and most of you uh, probably haven't, it's been out for a few months now, uh, but this is a book that is a collection of essays, so it's not, it's not a, uh, the usual kind of book I have, I, that, I, that I write, uh, where it has sort of a narrative to it. It's a collection of essays. There are 13 of them, uh, I believe, and uh, about half of them were previously published, and about half are new essays. And they all revolve around the theme of the South and the Ozarks. And what I'm going to do uh, tonight is uh, read a little bit from, uh, from about three different essays here. And uh, not, I'm not, well, it may put you to sleep, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Hopefully it's not that late yet. Uh, I have been up since 4.30, so it may put me to sleep. Uh, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll read a little bit and uh, just talk a little bit about the three essays. And then I want to open it up to questions. And usually that's where the funnest part is, is just hearing questions anyone has. And if you don't have any, then we get home uh, for supper a little bit earlier than we had planned. And, uh, well, I'm going to read... Uh, just uh, the introduction from the very first essay in here, it's called The Ozarks and Dixie. And uh, this one I wrote uh, 25 years ago. This is the oldest essay in this book. I, I was still working on my PhD at the time. I had about a year to go when I wrote this. And I remember thinking, I've trained as a Southern historian and I'm writing about the Ozarks. Maybe I should figure out if the Ozarks is in the South or not. Uh, and, and so I, I spent a lot of time, this uh, was something that I didn't even put in my dissertation. It just felt like an exercise I needed to do before I finished the dissertation to figure out if, in fact, uh, my mentor, Wayne Flint, who was a, a very uh, respected Southern historian, uh, really had the right student here, or if I was writing about some region that didn't even belong in his South. So I'm just going to read a little bit of this, and it'll give you a little flavor of the, of the kinds of essays that, that, are, that are in here. Uh, they're all scholarly to some degree. They all, are all but one of them have footnotes, uh, but many of them are written in first person, or at least partly in first person, and, and I try to incorporate my, my own sense of humor into, into some of these. I am a Southerner. My father is a Southerner. His father was. We all knew it, just knew it. I'm also an Arkansasier, and just about everybody knows Arkansasiers are Southerners, but I'm an Ozarker, and like our kinfolk back in Appalachia, we have always been a little different. At the age of 22, I left home to have my Southerness challenged. I had never spent more than two weeks at a time outside the Ozarks, except for a summer of National Guard training in Texas and Illinois. But at 22, I left for graduate school at Auburn University in Alabama, the true South, as I was about to discover. Much to my surprise, my Southerness wilted in the face of such a test. <laughs> Utterly unimpressed with my peripheral claim on the South, my apathy toward football, 
my disdain for grits and greens, and my predilection for yuns over y'all, the Alabamians chewed me up and spit me out. <laughs> In the Deep South, the heart of Dixie emblazoned on license plates, there was a different perspective. Back home, I could be in Missouri with a drive of less than 45 minutes. In Alabama, there was nothing but the old Confederacy for a full day's journey in every direction. And it didn't take those of us who made the trip down there long to appreciate the power of cultural geography. My wife later encountered this on her first day in an Auburn classroom. When the professor asked if anyone in the class was from up north, only one young woman near the back of the room raised her hand. My wife was shocked, as was the professor, I expect, when it turned out that the young woman was from Tennessee. <laughs> the Tennessee Yankee may have simply been very literal-minded, but I prefer to think she had also begun questioning her own southernness. The Deep South could do that to you. Stripping me of my southernness, these southerners rendered me a regional misfit, a native of the South whose southernness was suspect at best. Southerners have for generations participated in the exercise of self-definition. What is the South? Who are Southerners? How do we define Southern? Inherently confident in their Southerness, Southerners often describe themselves in the process of definition. Consequently, there are almost as many different definitions or descriptions of the South as there are Southerners. A Cajun's definition of the South would differ significantly from that of the Tennessee Mountaineer, at some point in my youth, I may have been myopic enough to define the South by my own experiences in the Arkansas Ozarks, but my four years in Alabama divested me of any notion that my little corner was representative of an entire region. Thus, in the late 90s, as a trained historian preparing to write a dissertation on the Ozarks, I began contemplating just how Southern this place was. And I'm still wondering it. I'm still trying to figure that out. I... Last, uh, well, it's been uh, a little less than a month ago, about three weeks ago, I got back from a two-week trip to Washington, D.C. And some of you may know that the Smithsonian Folklife Festival uh, this summer focused on the Ozarks, and I was out there for that. I really didn't have a whole lot to do, but I was just out there sort of uh, watching what all went on. And as you might expect, uh, there was a lot of questions about uh, where is the Ozarks, what is the Ozarks, and uh, almost to a person, all of my Missouri friends, when they were asked that question, would say it's somewhere in the Midwest, and, uh, and of course, I was, I just, you know, I just kind of shuddered when I would, when I would hear that, <laughs> uh, but I think they were right, uh, for them, it's somewhere in the Midwest. The Ozarks is, is one of those weird places that doesn't fit neatly into any of the bigger regional divides that we've created for the United States. If you grow up in the Missouri Ozarks, chances are you're going to grow up thinking of yourself as a Midwesterner. If you grow up like I did in the Arkansas Ozarks, you're probably going to think of yourself as a Southerner. And if you grow up in the Oklahoma Ozarks, I'm not really exactly sure what, <laughs> what in the Dickens uh, you think you are there, out there. But uh, that's, that's part of the conundrum of studying the Ozarks, is just where and what are we? We didn't figure it out in Washington, D.C. I think we just, uh, we just bum-fuzzled people uh, by coming up with a new map that even include, included part of southern Illinois in it to really confuse people. Uh, so, so now there, there really are uh, Yankee Ozarkers out there, out there somewhere in, in Illinois. Uh, but... This is really what the, the heart of what this uh, book is about. It's, it's, a, it's a contemplation on the South, on the Ozarks, and where those two regions sort of, uh, sort of collide. And because of my, my background in what you might call the marginal South, uh, I tend to focus on the margins of the South and marginal people. Uh, if, you, if you write a lot of stories about the Ozarks, there's a lot of marginal stuff out there because we're not only on the margins of the South, uh, but we're marginal in terms of uh, socioeconomics. Uh, you can't tell that here, uh, but where I live and where I spend most of my time in the Ozarks, uh, it's, uh, it's a poor place. And there are a lot of poor people on the, living on the margins out there. And that's part of what I, I try to explore 
in here as well. And so I'll use that to introduce my, my second little introduction to an essay. Uh, this is one that was originally published uh, in the Arkansas Historical Quarterly. And I, I think I remember where Patrick's sitting. Yeah, there, there you are. Uh, so Patrick had a, had a hand in, in editing this one, whipping it into shape, uh, an excellent uh, editor, a uh, longtime editor of the Historical Quarterly. I, all the stuff that he suggested I take out for the quarterly, I, most of it I put back in uh, for, for this. <laughs> But he had reasons for doing that. I, he, you know, the quarterly is not a place for, for first person, uh, you know, rabbit hole kind of things. And, and uh, I tend to do some of that. So I put, I put some of the first person back in this. But I'm just going to read a little bit of the introduction to this. It's called The Ordinary Days of Extraordinary Many. And many is the woman's name that it's about. It is not my finest moment. It's my wife's birthday. In a couple of hours, she'll get off work and carry the kids home from school, and I plan nothing to celebrate the occasion. Now, she's not going to be surprised by that, but... In fact, I'm far from home and won't be heading back anytime soon. I'm obsessed with another woman, and I've journeyed 70 miles across the White River watershed to find her house. She's the kind I always fall for, an outsider, intelligent, neurotic, determined, defiant, and deceased. <laughs> My wife did not like this at all until she got to the deceased part of this. <laughs> and still then, she really didn't like it. She doesn't like being a prop in, in any of my stories here. I first met Minnie four months ago, and this is uh, back when I, was, uh, when I was writing this, in the rambling diary she scribbled on notebook paper, at least the ones that survived long enough to be rescued from her old house by a conscientious neighbor. I thought about her every day since, and now, almost 40 years after her death, I've come to the place where she spent most of her life. I find traces of her in old courthouse records in the little town of Marshall. In the library, I find a clipping of a local newspaper article about Minnie's eccentric hoarding junk man son, Lawrence. I stop by the hardware store on the square. It looks like the kind of place that holds the ghost of everyone who trod these crumbling sidewalks, and they're here sure enough in the memories of 70-something proprietor George Daniel. And Mr. Daniel has since passed on. It turns out George's nephew was a college classmate of mine. In the rural South, we still like to know someone's people, compare family trees and acquaintances until we find a connection, a social ritual that almost always quickens the flow of information, and it works. George has been here all his life. He remembers many recalls making deliveries to her little house out in the country when he was a teenager working for his dad, Elmer, the E and E Daniel Hardware on the window. He even knows who owns Minnie's old place now. George gets on the phone, and a few minutes later in comes Robert Ace Hensley, my guide for the afternoon. I follow Ace north out of town onto a winding dirt road to a secluded little place called Zack. A tiny stop on the Missouri and North Arkansas Railroad in the first half of the 20th century it's nothing more than a scattering of houses now. Its only claim to fame was a sickly native son named James Baker who learned to play the guitar and yodel, hightailed it to California in the Depression, changed his name to Elton Britt, and in 1942 recorded the first country song to reach gold record status. There's a star-spangled banner waving somewhere. A mile beyond Zach and up a steep hill overlooking Bear Creek, we reach our destination. Minnie and Lawrence had settled here only a year before Baker left. From the looks of the drooping, unpainted three-room house that sits on this hillside, the only surviving sign of their years here, fate had a different trajectory in mind for Minnie and Lawrence. It is one of those early fall days when it seems as if the sun is trying to burn off all its stored energy in one brilliant afternoon. Its gaze is merciless on the treeless hillside where I stand shielding my eyes, squinting at a rocky field grown up in ragweed and sedge grass, or sage grass as we call it, trying to picture the jumble of rusting implements and discarded appliances that once littered this ground. Ace spent years erasing the signs of their existence, hauling loads of scrap metal to the recycler, toting piles and piles of worthless trash to who knows where. I wish he hadn't. I want to see what she saw. 
I want to feel the suffocation and disorder of living in a house surrounded by acre upon acre of rusting machinery, broken glass, and tin cans. I want to touch Minnie's world. And alas, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. But I did spend weeks and weeks transcribing parts of her diaries, and I got so invested in figuring out what in the world was Minnie's thing uh, that, I, I, that I took further steps, and I'll just read a, 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 a three more paragraphs here to let you know a little bit more about Minnie. My visit to Minnie's old house only stokes my interest in her unusual diaries. I read through page after page. I transcribe day after day almost 50,000 words, and it's only a drop in the bucket. It's clear that Minnie was not your average diarist. The third-person voice, something I've never encountered before in all my research. There are other oddities as well, enough of them that I, that I decide to seek professional help. For me, and belatedly for many, I contact the head of the psychology department at my university, explain my quest in a way that I hope won't make me seem as creepy as I feel, <laughs> and ask if he can recommend one of his professors. On a blustery January day, I trudge across campus to the office of psychologist Brooke Wisenhunt. Turns out her big sister and my wife were college basketball teammates. There is no need for us to connect. We're both professionals after all, but as natives of the rural South, it is a comfortable happenstance. I'm taken aback when she's familiar with Searcy County. Her father grew up there, she tells me, and they are descendants of one of the county's most notable families. It's a good omen. I introduced Dr. Wisenhunt to many, or at least to the bundle of eccentricities leaping from her papers, and Dr. Wisenhunt puts her on the couch. I walked Dr. Wisenhunt through Minnie's profile. In addition to her third-person journaling, Minnie seems to have been a chronic chronicler, keeping minute track of everything, from the number of eggs she gathered each morning to the exact price of each item she and Lawrence purchased. She studiously maintained a narrative daily weather record. Minnie spent inordinate amounts of time writing. Her surviving papers contained lengthy, rough drafts of letters, sometimes as long as 12 handwritten pages, that she presumably rewrote before mailing. They also reveal stacks of memos, copious notes on chores and activities that informed her daily diaries. As she grew, grew older, her diary entries grew longer and more minutely detailed. By the 60s, the diaries were densely packed with what seemed to be every thread of her life. What time she got up, when she ate meals and got dressed, when she emptied slop jars and brought in water from the cistern. Even more unusual was that she chronicled Lawrence's life with equal gusto, a practice that occasionally caused friction between them. Scarcely a day went by when Lawrence did not leave the 40-acre junk farm. His days were full of interactions with other people. At night or at the breakfast table the following morning, Minnie quizzed Lawrence on the things he did and the people with whom he dealt. She wanted to know and record every detail. The diaries and memories of descendants also reveal other traits, perfectionism, orderliness, judgmentalism, paranoia, and a proclivity for hoarding, though a much more organized brand of hoarding than that of her son. For Dr. Wisenhunt, the psychological profile cobbled from family memories in Minnie's writings leads to a possible diagnosis, and she wanted me to make sure that everyone knows it's a possible diagnosis because that it's not really an ethical thing to start diagnosing people who are no longer around but this is a this is a possible diagnosis obsessive compulsive personality disorder OCPD with perhaps a touch of obsessive compulsive disorder OCD a different but often overlapping diagnosis modern psychiatry defines OCPD as quote a pervasive pattern of preoccupation with orderliness perfectionism and mental and interpersonal control at the expense of flexibility, openness, and efficiency. Many, like people with OCPD, exhibited an abnormal preoccupation with details, rules, lists, order, organization, schedules, and intense perfectionism that often prevented her from completing tasks, an inflexibility about matters of morality, ethics, or values, an inability to discard worn out or worthless objects, and a penchant for miserliness in financial matters. I thank Dr. Wisenhunt and head back out into the cold, admiring Minnie's perseverance and her indomitable spirit. 
So there's more about many, but you'll just have to get the Arkansas Historical Quarterly, I guess, if you want the more about many. Uh, but there's even more in this one. Uh, but it was one of several stories that I have, uh, one of several essays that I have in this collection that are really about uh, marginal people in a marginal place. Uh, the Ozarks uh, that, that I see today, uh, I'm staying in Bella Vista, which I'm told is now age appropriate for me. Uh, <laughs> apparently that's why I'm there, I'm not really sure. But, uh, but in my trip up to Bella Vista and back down here today, uh, I don't see a marginal Ozarks, but it's out there. It's out there. Trust me, uh, these, these people uh, were and, and are out there. Uh, they're sometimes sort of, uh, sort of glittered out in the gold of, of northwest Arkansas. But, uh, but a lot of these stories are stories of marginal people. And the last uh, introduction I'm going to uh, read uh, to you is one that I also wrote uh, many years ago. It's a... Uh, one of the more personal stories in here. It's not a, it's not a heartfelt kind of personal uh, story in here. I guess the closest I come to that one is the final essay in the book, uh, which I had, uh, which is more about my uh, journey as a historian and my journey to come back home and to make sure that I stayed back home in a way that uh, most academics uh, are never able uh, to do. Uh, but I'll let you, uh, uh, read that one. I'm going to read something that's funner and uh, a, a lot uh, more lighthearted. This is a, one that I call Fireworking Down South. And, uh, and I started my fireworks career. Uh, that's probably not a sentence that you hear all that often. <laughs> I started my fireworks career, but I started my fireworks career uh, just north of Springdale uh, the summer that I, uh, after I graduated from high school. And, uh, and throughout college and throughout uh, graduate school, I sold fireworks. I was one of those people uh, that, you, that you see in tents along the side of the road. Uh, and we are just as untrustworthy as you suspect we are. <laughs> I, I, would, I would be ripping people off if I were sitting out there today. I, it's just in my blood, you know. It's, <laughs> but, uh, but I decided... Uh, uh, after the summer when I suffered from real life sleep deprivation and almost died, uh, that I was going to get out of the fireworks business. But uh, enough of it was still in me that I had to sort of deal with it uh, by writing this little essay. And I'll just read the introduction uh, to this, uh, fireworking down south. A door slammed shut, startling me from a sleep too light and too brief. Struggling to get my bearings, I raised up on my elbows and peeked out the passenger side window of my pickup truck. A yellow ball, brilliant and unrelenting, shot rays through a canopy of pine needles. It was already light, already hot, and I was already in a bad mood. The parking lot of Red Rocket Fireworks, the outskirts of Rock Hill, South Carolina, the 4th of July. I'd spent most of the dark morning hours in descent, skimming the interstates from Beckley, West Virginia to Rock Hill, fleeing the Alleghenies in a mad dash to the Piedmont downing too many Mountain Dews and Chico sticks at 75 miles per hour, only to arrive two hours before opening time at the cavernous Red Rocket Warehouse. A person in the fireworks business is rarely surprised by anything, and arriving at work to find a man in combat boots and a sweaty baseball cap sprawled in the seat of a pickup hardly qualifies as extraordinary. So I was invited in, offered coffee, which I declined in favor of another Mountain Dew, and given a seat on a vinyl chair the color of a ripe persimmon. The assistant manager wearing a pink golf shirt and khaki duckhead shorts took my order, which I had scrawled on the blank side of a four by six note card. I had deluded myself into thinking that I could do research while selling fireworks in West Virginia, so I actually had my old note cards with me, but the only thing I wrote on them were fireworks stuff. His subsequent phone call to an unidentified warehouse worker struck me as odd, even in a business as far off center as fireworks. I need a monkey driving a car, one hen laying eggs, two cuckoos, a fairy with a flower, one climbing panda, one cock crowing at dawn, and whatever we've got in the way of a Jupiter's fire or a thunder blast or a big bear. I could imagine the disconnect an innocent passerby might have experienced upon hearing such nonsensical spew. 
Fireworks speak is like the names of football plays or military instruction manuals or the banter of social science graduate students. It just doesn't make any sense taken out of context. And the context is so esoteric that explanation to the uninitiated is an exercise in futility. My mission in South Carolina on this muggy Independence Day morning was a simple one, to load as many cases of fireworks as I could into my long bed pickup so that the good folks of Beckley, West Virginia would not have to celebrate the anniversary of our severance from the British crown in peace and quiet. <laughs> I must confess that this was a noble mission, no matter how you look at it. Whether it was patriotic idealism or capitalism that fueled my quest, by early afternoon I was back in Beckley and by nightfall, most of the boxes were empty. All around Raleigh County, monkeys were driving cars, hens laying eggs, pandas climbing, fairies flowering, thunders blasting, and a mighty good time was had by all. I sat on the bed in my room at the Pagoda Motel, counting money and watching Sports Center. And it only gets weirder from that point <laughs> forward. That's my, that's my fireworks uh, story. Uh, this is, uh, in a lot of ways, as you can probably tell, this was, this was a fun project to do. I was, uh, I was inspired in, in large part, uh, I've always been inspired by uh, a now retired uh, UNC sociologist named John Shelton Reed. Uh, Reed had this ability to write scholarly stuff in a way that non-scholars, that just regular reading folk, uh, could read and enjoy, and, uh, and he used his sense of humor in a lot of his uh, stuff. And I've, uh, I'm not a sociologist, uh, but I've always tried to uh, pattern, uh, in some ways, my, my writing after that style. I, di I never wanted to just write for 13 other academics, and, and that's... Uh, and that's probably on the high side of, of what we, we tend to write for uh, uh, when we're just writing for ourselves. Uh, but I, you know, I always wanted people to, uh, to read and, and enjoy this stuff. And, and hopefully that's, uh, that's what you'll do if you, if you pick up up south in the Ozarks. And the good thing is uh, there's, there's really no start and no finish. So you can just you know, pick out the ones you like and read about them. And, uh, and then hand it off to a friend uh, and let them uh, read whatever they want. Uh, what I want to do, though, is uh, uh, just uh, talk, talk with Yuns and, uh, and see, uh, see what you have questions about. Anything about the Ozarks, uh, anything about the South. We have other people who can talk about the South here besides me who probably know more about the South than I do. Uh, but does anyone have any questions about the book or about anything else? Question as an observation. I always thought of myself as a hillbilly. I grew up in Madison County. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to the Army in 83. And I was stationed at what was Fort Polk. And I made friends with some people off base there. And uh, my experience there's two different kinds of people in Louisiana there's the Cajuns and then what we call Kunasses, which are the Louisiana hillbillies. And I was told I was a Yankee. <laughs> For somebody who's been a fan of the Dukes of Hazzard and you've got the flag tattooed on him, that was a little disconcerting yeah. to be called the Yankee. Yeah. And uh, I protested that, but <laughs> it's a similar experience to what you had in that I was told I was a Yankee because I was from Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good lesson in, uh, in comparative geography, I guess, you know, because... There's uh, my, you know, my dad always, my dad was a, uh, was a high school basketball coach and sometimes baseball coach. And he always said, you know, there's always somebody out there who's better than you. And he said the same thing when it came to fighting. You know, there's always somebody that can, that can whip you and you'll eventually, you know, uh, find that, that person. And I, I think that's, uh, that's similar in that uh, wherever you're from in the South, there's always somebody who thinks they're more Southern uh, than you are, and they probably are. If you're from Madison County, Arkansas, uh, then you know they're probably they're probably right about that. And I, you know, I discovered that uh, myself. Uh, I, I think there probably is an epicenter of southernness somewhere. Uh, I, I think I, I usually say it's in Lower Peachtree, Alabama, 
just because I love saying Lower Peachtree, Alabama, <laughs> which assumes there is a, you know, there's like a peach tree or maybe even an upper peach tree, Alabama, but this is Lower Peachtree. And, uh, or Vinegar Bend, that's another good one down in Alabama. Uh, but it, it does, uh, when, you, when you get out and, and you, you sort of see different parts of the South, you, you realize how, how diverse the South is. And, I, you know, it's just such a political and, uh, construct, a, a social construct, that we, that we have this thing called the South. And it's so tied up with history. You know, going back to what I said earlier about Missouri Ozarkers saying they're from the Midwest, Arkansas Ozarkers saying from the South, eh, that all stems from the Civil War. And the, the Missouri Ozarkers that I've talked to who have claimed to be from the South, if you start prying into their family tree, uh, you're going to find Confederates back there somewhere. And uh, it, it, it always happens in the one place in the Missouri Ozarks that you're m most likely to find people who will claim to be Southern is in Southeastern Missouri. And that's the part of the Missouri Ozarks where the rebels kept control. They were in control at the end of the Civil War and they kept it. Once Reconstruction was over, uh, that, that was very much Southern territory. And I have maps in there uh, linking uh, southeastern Missouri with most of northern Arkansas. And then we traded them Searcy County and Newton County. Uh, th those are the places that became uh, Republican counties and I guess what you might say the least southern counties in the Arkansas Ozarks after the Civil War. So it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, these, you know, cultural differences and differences in dialect and accent and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we're, you know, we're just barely hanging on here. If you look at, if you look at some 21st century maps that, that are drawn to reflect how often businesses and, and nonprofits use the term Southern, uh, we're no more Southern now than Springfield, Illinois, uh, in, in the Arkansas Ozarks. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we're, you know, I think we're more than that, but, uh, but, you know, that's the direction that we've been headed for, for a long time, yeah. We've had a couple of experiences too. It's not really a question either, but I feel like I'm in kindergarten saying, well, one time I did this. But yeah. <laughs> That's what this is about, it's, it's but, a group uh, share. So yeah. we, we moved here, we both have lived in a lot of different places. Um, I spent about five years when I was young in Oklahoma, and um, we moved here from Las Vegas, Nevada. And so when we moved here, and my, my sister and brother-in-law live in Utah, so they, we moved here and they said, well, how does it feel like living in the South? I said, well, <laughs> it feels more like the Midwest to me, you know, in this area. And they thought that was kind of strange. But um, our, our next door neighbors are from Russellville and Clarksville. And I can't even tell you how many times in the 10 years we've been here that they will say, now why do y'all move here? <laughs> with a tone like we didn't get their permission to right <laughs> that's and and i'm sure asked ask that same question yeah five times. yeah why well, tell yeah. us again why you moved here yeah. that's well, good I said we want to be around great people like you yeah <laughs> that's right yeah yeah well that's good i i, I don't have to ask you that question Could i ask yeah. you to clarify something yeah when i was a young boy and you they opened up the newspaper and went to the sunday especially the sunday comes you get a little line with the four blocks you know handicap and all the other little and there used to be one that was based on southern culture and i i remember there was things like major hooper hoople and uh snuffy smith and all those <laughs> one of those in one of those little little four block series would always have the picture of a little boy peeking around a tree a tree stump looking at two people talking as though he's really wondering he's, he's suspicious about what's going on do you remember which one that was because it kind of reminds me of, of an older impression of, of Ozarkians who you know when, if you drive around some of the areas you can still see like you said they're poor yeah. and they're, they're, they're sustenance people and uh, is that, is that going to be uh, Little Abner? I, I'm not sure. Well, it, might, it might be. I haven't I haven't gotten in there and looked at it, but I, but I, every time that somebody does that and asks us those kind of questions, like why are you here, 
Right. Yeah. Right yeah. 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 He's got this funny nose, and he's always peeking around the corner. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, do you do you know? I think it's Little Abner. Little Abner. I think it might be the South started the back door of Peabody Hotel. Oh, is that is that where it, is that where it starts? Yeah. Yeah. In Memphis, right? In Memphis. Yeah. The yeah. And it wasn't Yeah. The Delta started at the yeah. Peabody. Yeah, one of uh, yeah, they uh, the most southern place on earth is is uh, Jim Cobb uh, calls the the Delta, and it may be I've uh, if yeah there is sort of a an other side of the coin for the Ozarks. It might be the Delta, you know, in so in so many ways uh, from the fertility of the soil to historic demographics and and uh, lots lots and lots of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Something about uh, any food differences or cooking differences in the Ozarks from the rest of the South? Uh, <laughs> I would like to be able to say something about that, but I am not a foodie, and I know so little about food other than I eat it. When <laughs> I mean, I I really I, I I really don't. They at the at the Folk Life Festival, uh, they they wouldn't let me anywhere near. The food people, because I know so little about uh, about differences. I do know that uh, uh, when I checked into my my B and B this afternoon, I I had to ask for a good sized trash can because I brought my peas with me. Uh, Susan will appreciate that. I uh, I didn't. I I wanted to. I, I don't trust my uh, my family to to be able to tell when a pea is in roast near, as my grandpa always said, that means it's, it's ready to pick and it's, it's ripe. Uh, so I picked my peas before I left this morning and I brought them with me and I brought some, uh, I brought some okra uh, with me as we, that, you know, that's how we say uh, okra in, in the Ozarks, okra. And I, uh, so I, mainly I just didn't want the, uh, the, the innkeeper to be shocked when she looked at the trash can uh, Friday morning and there's a bunch of pee holes in there for no apparent reason, you know, and they're purple everywhere. Uh, but what I do know is that, uh, that I, you know, I, I grow a little bit of what I eat, but I don't know much about uh, the differences uh, in food. Okra, for instance, or okra. Okra? Uh, Fried is the only way my that. I, I, when my sister came up to uh, to witness the birth of my first child in, in 1960, she came up and my mother-in-law had this wonderful. Uh, she was from Conway. She had this wonderful Ozark meal, and Connie, who was a teenager, said, "That's a good way to ruin okra." Yeah. You know, because we we just cook it with tomatoes and onions and yeah, let it almost burn. Yeah. No, I. Uh, yeah. If it ain't fried and crispy, I'm squash is the same way with me. If it ain't burnt, it ain't right, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, and I, I, I recently uh, my and my wife. I I make uh, I I cook all my peas myself, uh, and my cornbread and that kind of stuff. Uh, but my wife usually does the. Uh, the squash and the okra and all that kind of stuff, and she has, she has uh, cut off my uh, squash eating this summer because I complained because she didn't she didn't cut the squash thin enough so it'd get nice and you know you got to have it burnt and crispy that kind of that kind of thing uh, after you dip it in you know cornmeal and and and, uh, and and hers were too fat you know so they were, you you could still you could still taste the squash which I don't want to do. <laughs> That is not that is not why you eat squash and okra. I mean, the the vegetable part of them is the least appealing part of any of that stuff. You're basically just eating fried cornmeal. And uh, my mother was a, a health cook, I guess. So vegetables at my house were just barely tender, yeah. and you know, salt and pepper. And so I tried to get my husband to accept that, you know, because they had snap beans that were cooked to death, literally. And I said, well, you know, when you cook them like this, you, you destroy half the vitamins. 
They said, yes, but they taste so good, you eat twice as much. <laughs> I'm I'm right there, yeah. If uh, yeah that uh, yeah those, those crunchy green beans, I just that that is not for me. That is not. Uh, yeah, we, there were several. I'll say this: even for the Missouri folks who were with us in Washington uh, and claimed to be Midwestern, now when it came to complaining about the food that they fed us all the time, they were pretty southern. Uh, because they were they were looking for cornbread and, and beans and all that kind of stuff too, uh, regardless of how midwestern they uh, they cl claim to be. And the weirdest experience: my daughter lives in San Juan. She grew up out there, and I went out there one year for Christmas. <coughs> I went to Bonds, which is one of their groceries. They sold cornbread. Yeah. Cooked cornbread. And it was the most boring thing. You don't know, buy corn. You make it. Yeah. 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 Probably, probably had a little sugar in it and everything. Right? Yeah. 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 It's some kind of pie at first. But yeah. But we had, we had uh, they, they, they tried to serve cornbread a couple times out when we were in, in D.C. And it was cake. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was, I mean, it was good, but it was, it was, you know, it was corn cake is really what it was. Did somebody have a hand up over, over here or, oh, okay. I'll, I'll say that, uh, as a little aside, my wife will attest that the, the vegetable to breading ratio is a significant and important matter. Mm -hmm. um, her, uh, her, 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 her metric is, uh, fried pickles. Okay. And the pickle of breading is, is an important thing. Now, I wanted to share that the, the Ozark, where it's South Midwest thing, it's not unique to this area. So the you know, Ozarkers can take some comfort in it. I once lived and worked in St. Louis, and I worked with a woman from New York named Rosemary. And the conversation came around, circled around to the South, and I said, well, yeah, I lived in the South, I lived in Arkansas, and she did immediately dismiss that and said, Arkansas is not the South, Arkansas is the Midwest. And uh, come to find out, Rosemary was from Buffalo, and she was a proud New Yorker, she was brash and, and outspoken and mouthy, and uh, she was from Buffalo. Well, we had another fellow who was there who was from New York City, and I said, oh, really, Rosemary's from New York. And he said, no, she's not. There's a parallel there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it. Warren. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, Warren is a chef. Uh, so uh, direct all your food <laughs> questions. <laughs> that, that direction, I haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah, good seeing you. Yeah. The, our, our same neighbors from Russellville, Clarksville, um, came over a couple of years after we moved in, and, and uh, the woman, she says, um, you know, you have hope growing in the back of your yard. And I said, oh, no, I didn't know. And she goes, were you, you going to eat it? And I said, um, no. And she goes, do you mind if we take it? And I said, you know what, you can have all of it you want. And I felt like saying you can have all the weeds in my garden. Yeah. <laughs> any, any and I, all weeds. Then I started we looking up poke and how you Poison. cook it and eat it and, and right. that. So I would know the next yeah. time. But yeah, that's uh, never. Yeah, uh, except for the song, I, I never oh, really heard of. Yeah, what yeah, the, the uh, uh, poke weed. Yeah, that was uh, that was a staple of marginal people in the South for for many many uh, generations because it's it's one of the first things that is green in the in the spring of the year. So, you know, if you've been you've been waiting all winter, eating you know, cornbread and salt pork or something like that, then, you know, you'll, you'll take a chance with some poisonous weeds. Uh, yeah. And I've heard, I've talked to, to old timers who, uh, I, well, one of my, uh, one of my wife's uh, aunts told me the story about uh, when she was a, a teenager and her parents were off doing something. I don't know what they were doing, uh, but they had left her in charge of making the poke salad. And she was just, so nervous because she was just convinced she was going to poison her her siblings 
and uh, you know, trying to make this this weed into something edible. But but it didn't happen, and she made it through it. So uh, that was something probably a lot of people lived through. In Europe, uh, in places, punk is grown as an ornamental plant, like on purpose. Yeah, so pretty. I started doing that, yeah. and um, one of my neighbors doesn't quite get it on the property line. He pulls it up and I put it. <laughs> yeah, it's a well. It, it's an acquired ornamental taste. I, I guess I, at at certain times of year, they're you know when they get when they get purpley looking and they get the, the they get the little uh, poke berries on them and you know at certain times of year they're they're quite attractive weeds. But uh, you know so is uh, so is mullen. But you know that's but by and large it's usually pretty ugly. You know that uh, mullen is to. Yeah, a lot of them are that like that. You mentioned Brookfield, uh, Missouri, and I heard that it originally was part of Arkansas and then seceded, or I don't know what the right word would be, to Missouri. Is that true? Yeah, uh, Patrick may have to. It's it's been a long time since I taught Arkansas history. They don't let me do that at Missouri State uh, for some reason. I, I tried once and it didn't go over well. The uh, uh, but yeah, they uh, originally the. The 3630 line, from what I remember, was supposed to go all the way to the Mississippi, wasn't it, Patrick? And then, and it was the people of. When Missouri organizes as a state, yeah, that's the part of Arkansas that won. Oh. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That little fertile. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, it was good uh, good farmland, and if I remember right, the the people uh, who lived down there even they wanted to stay in Missouri. As well, I thought that there were yeah. weren't there some prominent landowners that uh, yeah. insisted upon being in Missouri and not Arkansas. Yeah, for yeah. Whatever and the reasons were. Yeah. Were we still and, in territory? And you know, in in, uh, in retrospect, I don't think anybody cares on you know either but side of the state line. It can happen in Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's a. Uh, there is some some really uh, really valuable farmland over there. Well, just like you know, it's an extension of Mississippi County, basically, is what it uh, what it. Well, there is a Mississippi County over there in the in the Boot Hill, but yeah, yeah. Another uh, another part of the uh, part of the South. It's a little you know a little different from its neighbors. When you speak of the Ozarks and you mention okay Missouri, Arkansas, North Dakota, Arkansas, then you said Oklahoma. What actually is, is it a geological uh, formation that creates the Ozarks? Yeah, the, the Ozarks is a physiographic region. It's a, that's probably the easiest way to identify the boundaries. It's much more difficult to identify the cultural Ozarks, which you might define as where people say they're in the Ozarks, you know, to steal from uh, sociologist John Shelton Reed. He finally just said the South is where Southerners live and uh and if you you know if you try to find the ozarks that way uh then you know it's more difficult but yes there is a physiographic ozarks region uh that is uh, for the most part just a severely eroded plateau or uplift and uh the, the ozarks are not mountains uh despite you know we call the boston you don't have to drive too far south of here and you're in the boston mountains technically they're not mountainous uh, one way to think of the Ozarks is just a big land of ditches. I mean, that's really what it is. You know, all, all of our ridges and hills, have, they've been formed by erosion and, and water runoff and, uh, over you know, millions of years. And that's basically, we're just a, just a big ditchy place, which to me is just very Ozark. You know, I mean, we're... we're we're not even mountains. We can't even claim that. I mean, it's just, we're just really eroded here. And, and most of it was done, you know, before the New Deal got involved in, in this stuff, millions of years before the New Deal uh, got involved with this. Uh, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, the, yeah, the, it's roughly the size of the state of New York, the, the Ozark. So it's, it's a pretty good sized region. There's even a little, little tiny, corner of Kansas. I, I read one, uh, one person who said there's 
I think it was, there's one pasture in Kansas that's, that's in the Ozarks, but you're probably not going to find anybody in that little corner of Kansas. You know, it's up around uh, Galena and just, just on the other side of Joplin is where the, the Kansas Ozarks is. But yeah, you're probably not going to find anybody there who would claim to be an, an Ozarker. Yeah. yeah. And you'll find plenty of people who live in other places in the physiographic Ozarks who will fight you if you try to call them an Ozarker. And, and they're not, uh, you get, the farther north you get, you get into the Missouri Valley, it's in the physiographic Ozarks, but most of those people do not identify with the Ozarks at all. And again, it's for historical reasons. Uh, the, the Missouri Valley was heavily settled by German immigrants before the Civil War. They tended to be better educated, better off uh, than their English-speaking neighbors, and they uh, remain sort of separatist. They didn't really, you know, want to have anything to do with those folks, uh, the kind of hillbilly type folks. And to this day, their descendants uh, really kind of get their backs up if, if you try to try to bring them into the Ozarks. So we just kind of let them go. And, uh, you know, I mean, beautiful country, rolling hills, and it looks like northwest Arkansas up there. But if you don't want to be in the Ozarks, well. They can live in the Ozarks, well, but not be Ozarks. Yeah, we, so we trade them for folks in the southern part, of, uh, in the folks in central Arkansas who want to be in the Ozarks, but they're not really. <laughs> so, you know, there, there is a trade off. I grew up mostly in Cleburne County, and so I, I was wondering what you think about sort of the evolution of Batesville in that area as that being one of your, you know, your places, and it being yeah. kind of an anomaly that, like what you were just talking about with central Arkansas being like the Ozarks, but it's not. And Batesville and, and Mountain View and towns like that being, you know, the Ozarks, but but kind of at the margin. But a difference. And and the way it is now versus the way it was, say, twenty or thirty years ago. Right. Yeah. When I was when I was growing up in in Izzard County, which is right across uh, White River from from Stone County, where uh, Mountain View is, Mountain View was the Ozarks to me because that's where, that's where the Ozark Folk Center was, and so that's it was it was branded. You know, to use a more modern-day term, a Mountain View had kind of branded itself as the Ozarks, uh, where I grew up was too. But the tourists weren't coming where where I live, <laughs> and they're still not coming to to, to where I live. Uh, so that was so Mountain View is to me it, it you know it was the Ozarks, and it's very very Ozarky, but very poor. It was ex extremely uh, poor uh, up until I mean it. it it's still a, a, a pretty poor place compared to Northwest Arkansas, but it's not nearly as poor as it was back in the 50s and 60s and 70s when they were trying to get all that started. All of that started as an effort to kickstart the economy. I mean, that's really what uh, what all that was about. Uh, and then we get you know the, all this folk music and crafts and all that kind of stuff out of it. But it was really a, uh, an effort to kickstart the economy there, which was terrible. Uh, Batesville, to me, has always been, it's kind of a hybrid town uh, because you go a few miles down White River and you're in flat country. You're in basically the kind of the westernmost reaches of the Delta uh, by the time you get down to Jacksonport, Newport, that area. Uh, and then you, you go any north or west of Batesville and you're in the Ozarks. Uh, Old-timey Batesville people, I think, just kind of always saw themselves as just Batesville. I don't think they. I don't think they really identified with one region or another. They're always polite to me when I go and give talks in Batesville. This, you know, this nice little Ozark guy. He's going to talk about the Ozarks, wherever that is. Uh, but, uh, but you know, I, th I think, you know, that's that's always been kind of a Batesville story. But it, uh, you're definitely in the more marginal part of the Ozarks. Uh, for the most part, the farther east you go in the Ozarks, uh, the poorer and the more marginal it gets. And that's certainly the case in Missouri. Uh, there's uh, uh, south-central and southeastern Missouri, and I'm not even talking about the boot heel. I'm talking about the, the hill country of south-central and southeastern Missouri is much poorer than any place in Arkansas and has been for years and years. Those are where you're really uh, what the government calls uh, persistent poverty counties, counties that, that census after census after census have 
20 percent, 25, 30 percent of the people live in poverty. That's where that's where almost all those counties are. They're in they're in southern and uh, southeastern Missouri, and uh, you know people just assume because we're Arkansas that all the poor Ozark people live in Arkansas. But uh, but Missouri is really I mean they're beating us in that category. We got to get on the ball. <laughs> we got we got to as long as uh, Walmart and all this other stuff's around, we are never going to catch them. But uh, you know we can we can hope. I was just going to tell you another little story. I have a friend that was Air Force man in 79. He got stationed in Cheyenne and he ended up marrying a woman from Wyoming. They moved back down here. They live out in Farmington. And when they moved from Wyoming, uh, this is back in the days prior to phones and GPS, they were driving in the U-Haul truck and she's looking in the Atlas. And finally she looks up and she says, honey, where's Fayetteville? He said, I have to laugh and tell her, no, honey, it's Fayetteville. It's just we say Fayetteville. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He should have scratched that out on the map. So you know, yeah, yeah. It is. It is fitful uh, for a lot. But I not not so much anymore. I, I I've got a feeling that the the fitful folks are in a extreme minority uh, these days. And I don't know much about Northwest Arkansas, but just I just get that feeling. Uh, yeah, it's it's grown. Uh, that I think back to. My first experience with Northwest Arkansas, uh, I, I, didn't go to, I didn't go to school here, uh, never spent a lot of time here, uh, but that selling fireworks. And I, I, I'm not even sure if we were in Washington or Benton County. We were somewhere right there on the county line between Springdale and Lowell, uh, somewhere in there. And, uh, and I think back uh, to that summer, and we had, to, we had a night watchman because you, you, know, you can't exactly lock up a tent uh, that is not how it works. So somebody's got to sleep out in that thing, and uh, we were right on 71. We were we were right there on 70 on the west side of 71, right around the county line. And I can remember his his thing. He was a, a, a fellow, one a, a kid that I'd gone to high school with, and I can remember going in and relieving him in the morning, and uh, and him always bragging that he had taking a leak in the middle of Highway 71 in the middle of the night. <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was so, this was 35 years ago, and it was so different, and it was so undeveloped out there, and where you could relieve yourself in the middle of Highway 71 if you were so inclined, and apparently at least one person was <laughs> uh, to do that. But I, I think, I think the, the uh, population sign for Springdale read like 18,000 or something at, at that time, and it was, uh, and but it was, you know, it's, it's only been 35 years, but it was just, it was like a different, uh, different place in many ways. And then, you know, things exploded in the 90s, and and uh, you know, it's just a very different place now. So don't don't try that. Don't try that. Uh, you might be able to do it in, in on 71 now that the 49's open, but I, I wouldn't try it anyway. I'd probably get arrested. Uh, this area, they took the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville allegedly because it was up in the mountains where it was cool and there were not mosquitoes. And I, who knows? Maybe their children were away from the vices of Little Rock, but, but for whatever reason, we were considered cooler and more helpful. If you look into some of the older history of Bella Vista, people drove their Model Ts down from Chicago on gravel roads to vacation down there. So we're kind of on this pipeline of, of uh, vacationing, you know, from, from down up north and down south. But really what made this area was when they dammed those, uh, the rivers and uh, made the stream of lakes, Beaver Lake here and the Teuton water line has made uh, development possible here that was never possible 30 years ago. So I don't know if that affected eastern Arkansas as much, but, but the addition of that, that uh, sort of pearl necklace of uh, recreational and uh, yeah, flood controlling lakes made this area. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, I write a little bit about that in, uh, not in this book, but in 
in my previous book uh, to this, volume three in my History of the Ozark series. Uh, that's a, it's a very much an underappreciated story of the Ozarks, the damming of lakes by the Army Corps of Engineers, mainly by the Army Corps of Engineers in the, uh, throughout the middle of the 20th century. And it, and it did lead to a lot of economic development. I would argue that there would be no uh, Bass Pro Shops in Springfield, Missouri, if it, if it wasn't for that, because in Springfield you've got lakes, uh, reservoirs to the north, reservoirs to the south, and Springfield's kind of smack dab in the middle of that. And, you know, it, it was just kind of a perfect place uh, to start a business like that. But uh, they are uh, very, very important to the, to the story of, of Arkansas, the story of the Ozarks. Yeah. Also, for, I don't know if it was because of topography or because of uh, Scotch-Irish immigration or whatever, you know, Hill people, whether here or in Appalachia, have this reputation for being independent and stubborn and isolated and not accepting of our systems of power. So when they created the Buffalo National River, people were a little mad about the federal government coming in there and taking their River Valley farmland and making it into the National Scenic River. And I'm uh, sure that it, with these dam, damming up of the rivers and creating the lakes, there was some of that too. Although I never heard about it being as uh, vociferous as people were with the Tennessee Valley. Uh, they, they were serious about it. You're touching on some of the very essays that are that are in the book. There's an essay on Scots-Irish uh, thesis, if you want to call it that, uh, of the of the Ozarks in there, there's an essay on uh, the Buffalo River and uh, the nationalization. And there was a lot of pushback. You didn't hear much about it uh, because uh, almost to a person, newspaper editors were big boosters for, for nationalization of the river. They were big boosters for the building of dams. And so a lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of the pushback just didn't get covered in a in a, in a public way, but uh, there was definitely a lot of that. Uh, to this day, uh, southeastern Missouri, where the Ozark National Scenic Riverways is, and I, I just have to clear this up, uh, this is probably not the best place to do it, but uh, the Buffalo National River is not the first national river. Uh, that, is, that is current river. Uh, the Ozark National Scenic Riverways, a few years before the Buffalo National River, uh, go tell your friends. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna start this, and maybe, maybe it'll, maybe it'll take effect one of these days. But, uh, uh, but that uh, you go up there around the current river country, Ozark National Scenic Riverways country, and there are still people raring to, to fight up there over, over losing their land. And I don't even, th I, I think the people who are raring to fight now. A lot of them are just people who moved in because they just wanted to fight about stuff. And, and, and they found a, a group of people that, you know, said, oh, great, you know, come on in here and, and, and uh, let's, you know, go, go to war with us. Uh, but uh, that's it's still very much, and I talk about that in one of the essays in there about my experience at, at a kind of like a town hall meeting in, in, in southern Missouri where I where I, I saw henchmen, I saw, uh, I got to looking at the exits to make sure I knew how to get out of there if I, if I needed to. And uh, I can run faster than I look like I can run if, if somebody's after me, you know. I, but uh, but it, was, it, got, it got pretty wild and it was all, and, and it stems back to the 1960s and the taking of, of that land by the National Park Service. It was, uh, it was yeah, and it's still, and, and uh, it was uh, the main promise, which was economic development, e economic salvation, uh, certainly never happened. I mean, it just, it's still one of the poorest counties in the state of Missouri, uh, the county that's in the heart of that. And uh, so that certainly didn't salve any, any wounds uh, by people to, uh, to sort of give up their lifestyle and give up their land and then you don't even get you don't even get economic revitalization in return. Uh, you know, so St. Louis people can come down and and you know canoe canoe your streams. You know that that kind of thing. You know. I, I 
I worked in the Harrison Social Security office for 10 years, and I ran straight into that Scott Cypress culture. It really made me appreciate the Snuffy Smith uh, <laughs> industry. But I learned something, because I was interviewing the guy, and he told me his vehicle was a Toyota truck, mm -hmm. and his son was Ari. And I said, how do you spell that? He said, I-R-A, Ari. And then I asked him what his wife's name was, it was Arzoni. Okay, then how do you spell that? It's A-R-I-Z-O-N-A, -A, Arzoni. Yeah. Well, that gave me a flashback to Snuffy Smith because there was a character in there, a woman named Zoni May. And when I was a kid reading that, I was wondering, where the heck did they come up with that name? And then years later in Harrison, I found out. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they may have borrowed that name from, uh, from Maul Barker, who was... Uh, she was Arizona, uh, Ar Ari or Arizona Barker from the Barker gang. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that is Upland South dialect uh, for you. Uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, there's a, well, I, I tell people, my, my, my grandpa mispronounced every state name in, in the union. And uh, if, if there was no obvious way to mispronounce it, uh, he would just come up with a, you know, just add another syllable or take away a syllable or something like that. Every state name, I mean, there's just, uh, there was no end to the things that he would uh, miss. But, of course, uh, you know, mispronounce is, that's, that's a, a label that, you know, speakers of, of standard English put on people who don't speak standard English. And, uh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. reading a, um, a, a, like a post on uh, Facebook, I guess, and uh, someone was correcting someone else's grammar, mm -hmm. and the next post was, these are Irish people, don't insult them. Like, don't correct their grammar, that's yeah. insulting. Yeah. I thought, that's interesting. Well, <laughs> or they could have just been afeared that they were going to get beat up by the, <laughs> by the Irish people. I'm not sure. But, that, I mean, that's, you know, that's a whole... That's a whole other thing, uh, you know, when you, when you start talking about uh, the way people talk. And, and I think we're, we're probably a little more evolved here in the 21st century for any number of reasons uh, in the way that, or the, the latitude that we give people to speak however they want to speak. But we, but we know we, uh, every language uh, group in the world has its dialects that within that language group uh, sound dumb, uh, that, that sound, uh, you know, that, that sound smarter, or whatever they are. And, you know, we live with that. And anybody who grows up with some, with some kind of Southern accent or Southern dialect, you, you realize that that's, you know, that's part of that stereotype that's been attached to that. Uh, it's, it's also, you know, linguists will also tell you that people uh, find a Southern accent more trustworthy uh, they they assume that you're nice uh, if you have a if, if you have a southern accent. So there you know there there's a range of there's a range of reactions that people have to the way you talk just just because of your dialect wherever you are and everybody you know everybody has a uh, has a has a dialect. Uh, anyone uh, and I uh, I don't know how much room they have, uh, but that is actually the the topic of my talk uh, Friday morning at the United Lutheran Church in Bella Vista. It's um, the Ozark dialect. And uh, so anybody who wants to come by at 10 o'clock that morning, uh, just just hop on by and we'll, and I will straighten you out on, <laughs> on, on how to talk Ozark. I think uh, you had your hand up. Yeah, I guess I have a different accent outing myself here and not from here. Um, but I'm curious about your use of the term marginal and marginalized. It's like in a lot of the circles I'm in, it comes up around conversations of most specifically like race and diaspora. I'm wondering how that intersects with your use here. Uh, well, it comes up in the book as well. Uh, there's, uh, there's one essay on a, a black community uh, that I included in there and that would, I mean, and you're right that generally especially in the academic world, uh, when we're talking about marginalized people, uh, we, we generally sort of uh, reduce it down to race and ethnicity. Uh, to me, that's, 
that's you know just reductionism. I mean, that's you know, it, uh, there are many other ways of defining marginalized uh, that that aren't just based on skin color and, and that that kind of thing. And uh, and so I think that's I mean that's definitely part of the story. But uh, you're you know you're ignoring a whole lot of people if if you uh, if you assume that there aren't white people in America who are marginalized groups, you know, however, however you want to define that. And the Ozarks and Appalachia are kind of the two, the two bastions of, of uh, poor whites and that still in the United States. So, yeah. Yeah, one more question. I have yeah. one. Um, I'm talking about Arkansas, Arkansas Sawyer. When we moved here in the 70s, if you said Arkansas, you were kind of like laughed at. It's Arkansan. But now I've moved back after spending a few years on the East Coast. And I'm here in Arkansas, you're used a lot more. So was that just something weird going on in the 70s, or is that a new kind of change? Yeah, <laughs> well, it, uh, yeah, I guess you could say if, if, if Donald Harrington represented Arkansas in the 70s, it was definitely something weird going on. And, and Her, uh, Harrington, for those of you who don't know, uh, Donald Harrington was a, a novelist who, who taught here at the University of Arkansas for many years, and he was a champion of, of Arkansas. And, and, and he wasn't the only one, but I think, I think a lot of it is just, uh, just people from Arkansas kind of taking agency for themselves and saying, you know, we're going to call ourselves whatever we want to call ourselves. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, our Kansan sounds really close to Kansan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that may not uh, set, set right with everybody. Uh, but I, uh, I have long preferred the term Arkansas year, and I uh, call myself that. And usually I have to defend it, you know, from some editor or something like that who, who wants to change it to our Kansan. But, but I realize that I'm in a, uh, that, when I was, you know, 25 years old, I would not have been so bold to have done that. Uh, you know, it, I'm I'm in a more privileged position where uh, where I can call myself whatever I want to call myself now, and so that's uh, so I choose to do that. And uh, I like Charles Portis talking about escape philosophy. We tried hard not to be Arkansas for yeah. a long time. And we're starting to own it back yeah. and we're turning back to what's more traditional. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always that tension, that, that pull. I, I was talking to a guy the other day who works for the state parks uh, department. And, uh, and I don't want to get this completely wrong, but it's not going to keep me from talking about it. Uh, so, uh, they, uh, but it, he, uh, the, the topic of, I think it was uh, coonskin hats, came up, or maybe it's beaver hats or something like that, uh, but uh, apparently that was something at, like at state park gift shops and stuff like that, that the, that the state of Arkansas will not, will not approve the selling of that because, you know, out of fear that it reinforces a, uh, you know, a negative stereotype, uh, kind of a backwoods stereotype of, of Arkansas. Uh, and... No, I don't think, and they, and they probably, well, they'd probably be fake anyway, uh, you know, that, uh, but, uh, so, I mean, that's still, I, I think, I think Arkansas, and I think me, this is mostly Little Rock, I think Little Rock still uh, has, has big issues when it comes to uh, living with, uh, accepting, and certainly the idea of embracing Arkansas's, you know, less savory image and, 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 and you have it here in Northwest Arkansas too. You know, you get crystal bridges and then you get the squirrel cook off. Yes. And, and so those, I, you know, I see those as kind of the, you know, the two sides of that, of that tension in a way, it's kind of a dialectical process, I guess. And, uh, but I, I, but I still say, and I, and I wrote a book called Arkansas, Arkansas many years ago on that very topic. And I, and, and I still say just, eh, why don't you just let people be what they are, and, and uh, you know you don't have to don't have to run from it. 
but I think the state of Arkansas, we, we've always been running from that, or there have been certain people in Little Rock who's, who have always been running from that and ready to throw the rest of us under the bus. You know, anybody who, who comes close to, to matching that stereotype. Uh, but at some point, you just got to quit worrying about it. Just do your thing, be who you are, and, and uh, talk the way you want to talk. And, uh, but like I said, it's easy for me to say, uh, it, and, because I'm not out there trying to get a job. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about uh, being discriminated against because I, because I talk like Gomer Pyle. That, that kind of thing, but, uh, but certainly there are people who, you know, who face, who face that and have to, have to sort of, you know, try to, uh, try to change themselves to a certain degree to, uh, to fit in with society and get jobs and advance economically and all that kind of stuff. So lots of stuff. Uh, we've, we've touched on most of my books uh, in, in this short conversation. I, I appreciate you uh, hanging around for this. Uh, we do have, uh, I'll be in the back uh, signing books, and we've uh, still got a, a table full of books back there. And uh, I hope you enjoy Up South in the Ozarks. Thank you. Thank you.